This morning I want to tell you an incredible and true story from the history of God's work with his people. It's in 2 Kings, and what I hope this morning will happen is that you become reminded of just how incredibly gracious God is. If you ever find yourself feeling like God has given you too much grace already that he probably wouldn't give you more. Or if you imagine that now that God has given you grace, like now it's up to you to do your work and your part. Um, I hope you are reminded this morning that God pours out in Christ grace upon grace upon grace. Even sometimes to those we would prefer he would give his wrath to or his justice to or his judgment to. And make no mistake, all evil will be punished. Vengeance is God's, so we don't take it up. But God's desire, it is the Lord's will that none should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. God's outrageous invitation of grace to be received in Christ is for all people, even the people you don't like. Even the people who vote differently than you do, even the people who are obnoxious about how they vote differently than you do, even the people who hold to genuinely difficult for you to accept positions, socially, religiously, about faith. I mean, the people that you would be tempted to despise, or even when you're honest, count as your enemies, it is God's desire to pour out to them an incredible grace and kindness. This is how great God is. So, His grace sometimes gets poured out on people that if we were honest, we would prefer that He didn't pour His grace out upon so this happens in the book of 2 Kings for a man named Naaman. Now, um, we're not um, Jewish, most of us, or Middle Eastern, most of us, and so some of the racial and ethnic tension in the story gets lost on us, but it didn't get lost on the people in Jesus' day. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he had begun proving himself to be the Son of God, healing all kinds of people, driving out demons, doing miraculous things. And it was time for him to go back to Nazareth, his hometown where he was from. So Jesus appears in the synagogue one Sabbath day, that's like their version of a church service, and he reads this to them from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And they are like, hallelujah, yes, we want God's grace. He is our God and we are his people. And they marvel a little bit at Jesus. And they're receiving with gratitude the word that he is speaking. They know he is claiming the the blessing of the prophet Isaiah upon them. But then someone in the group, probably multiples of them, begin to think, wait a minute, we know this guy. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this a little bit much for him to claim? And Jesus, who knows all things, but he can also read a room better than any public speaker you've ever heard, and he's like, I... I know what you're going to say. You're going to quote to me the proverb, physician, heal yourself. Like, you're going to want from me what I've done in Capernaum. And Jesus, in a way that only he can, he confronts them in their pride. And he presents to them, in a way that they are offended, the incredible blessing and generosity and graciousness of God on the foreigner, on their enemies, on the ones that they think don't deserve God's grace as much as they do, as God's people. And he says to them this, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine when it was over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, none of God's people, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet.
prophet Elisha. And none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. Now, those to you don't sound like fighting words. You don't even know the significance of those things. If you were in the congregation in Nazareth that day, you know exactly what Jesus was doing. And you would be so offended as they were, that he is suggesting, he's actually more than suggesting, he's reminding them from their own history that though they count themselves as the one who are worthy of God's grace, God's favor, God's blessing, God's deliverance, they see themselves as the ones who are poor, the ones who are oppressed, who should receive God's grace in favor. He reminds them from their own history. God has poured out his grace in his favor in times past, even on the foreigner, even on their enemies, and not on them in the way they thought they should receive. So the congregation is so mad. I mean, these are real people. These are real things. Imagine if you got so mad in church, so appalled by what I was telling you about God, and I showed it to you in the Bible, and it so offended you and angered you, you decided to have a mutiny and run me out of the church. That's exactly what they did. They ran Jesus out of the synagogue to the cliff in Nazareth to push him off the edge is how offended they were when they could see clearly how gracious God was on one that they counted their enemy. 2 Kings chapter 5, if you brought a Bible or have your phone, you could join me there. This is the story of Naaman. Naaman is a great man, the story opens by telling us, because of his position, of his power, of his influence. He's the commander of the army of the king of Syria. This is an enemy of the Jews. Around 1000 BC, basic Bible chronology. A thousand years before Jesus is the glory of the nation of Israel, King David and King Solomon. They are one united people. They have more wealth, more influence, more military power than they would ever have after that. Well, Elisha, that I introduced you to last week, he is in a valley of Israel's regional significance. Israel is now a divided kingdom the nation Israel in the north, the capital is Samaria, and then the nation of Judah in the south, their capital is Jerusalem. They are now a weakened people. Enemies in the region that used to pay them tribute are now like, ah, I'm done paying you tribute. You can come and get the money I owe you. And so there is war breaking out around them. Syria is a neighbor of the northern kingdom Israel. They're neighbors, they don't like each other, and the Syrians have grown in influence and power. So this is the commander of an army of an enemy. And he's a great man with his master and in high favor. Look at this, verse 1. Because by him, Yahweh had given victory to Syria. This is a, just a, a regular statement in the eyes of the historian and God's people, that all things exist under the sovereignty and the control of God, even the movements of an enemy nation. Naaman is a mighty man of valor, but he's got a major problem. He is a leper. Uh, leper in the Old Testament is a broad term for all kinds of skin diseases. Isn't that fun? I thought maybe it would be good to show you some graphic pictures of various skin <laughs> diseases. That would be interesting. It would make everybody itchy and start to wonder if the rash that they have is actually something more. Leviticus 13 gives great detail about all of the problems of leprosy. Leprosy is contagious most of the time. If, I mean, if someone really had leprosy, they're going to die. They get ostracized from the community that they live in because it's contagious. I mean, if you think the isolation of COVID is bad, leprosy, like the quarantine period, is forever to your death, lest anybody else get it. So Naaman, imagine, he has all the power, all the prestige, all the legacy, all the honor a person could ever want, but he has a condition that will rob him of all of those things eventually. I mean, I think it's a wonderfully human picture of how significant physical health is. I mean, you can have everything in life 
And if you don't have physical health, well, then what are you going to do with all that everything you have? And so here is a man of great honor, great power, but he has a problem that he can't do anything about. Now, remember, we read all of the Scriptures through the lens of Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all the Scriptures. So leprosy is actually a wonderful picture of sin and of Naaman's desperate need. So something interesting happens. The Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. So somehow, under the sovereignty of God, this little child... This little girl gets carried off by the Syrians on one of their raids into Israel. This is an enemy who raided their land, took people back, and this little girl now lives as a slave in Naaman's house, and her job is to serve Naaman's wife. Now, this little girl has a heart that I long to have, Because she says to her mistress, she says, if only Naaman, if only my master could go to Samaria and meet with the prophet, the prophet, he could be healed of his leprosy. I mean, this is a wonderful picture of this little girl who knows God, who somehow, somehow in her heart has a desire for the one who has enslaved her to know the grace and favor of God. I would not desire the grace and favor of God upon the dirt bag that enslaved me. This little girl does. And so she makes it known to her mistress, the wife of Naaman, about this prophet. So Naaman, verse 4, goes to the king and says, hey, um, this little girl from the land of Israel has told me about this prophet who can heal me. And the king of Syria says, go, I will send you a letter. The king of Syria, sure, we'll get you healing, commander of my army. There's a place for you to go get healed. Let's go get it. I'll write you a letter. So that's an official correspondence so that Naaman can show up at the king of Israel, and so he does. He goes in, he takes with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing, which to us seems a little bit strange. He's going to show up with some clothes. We don't value clothes. He's going to show up with some gold. Um, it's $3.8 million worth of gold by today's accounting. Okay. Now we're talking, and about $240,000 worth of silver. So we're about $4 million in the clothing, which is like, wait, go to the Goodwill, get all the outfits you want. I don't know, we got more clothes in our closets than you could do anything with. It seems insignificant. Picture more like bolts of expensive fabric, not like four medium shirts and three large pair of pants. Like, don't picture outfits like luxurious fabric. They used it as currency for trade and value. They're bringing the best. He's bringing the best of what he has to the tune of four plus million dollars. So great is his desperation. So great is the need that he has that he can't meet for himself. So he brings everything that he has. Now, Like, keep in mind your own life, your own experience, even as a child of God, how difficult it is to believe sometime that God who has given you grace desires to give you even more grace. Naaman has a need that he can't meet, and he's desperate, and he takes what he has that is most valuable. So he's got four million some dollars, and he comes with the authorization of his king, the king who is powerful. Everything the world values, power, influence, might, money. And he goes to the king of Israel with this letter, and he gets presented to the king. When the king of Israel reads the letter, he freaks out. He tears his clothes. What in the world is he doing? He says, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man, this foreign king, sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? He's picking a fight with me, the king of Israel says. That makes good sense, doesn't it? 
He knows he can't cure a person from leprosy. What in the world is he going to do about this? And the neighboring enemy king sends his most powerful warrior with a letter ordering up a healing. Yeah, how is this going to go down? Uh, I, uh, no, I can't heal you. Yeah, except for my army's bigger than your army, and my $4 million here says you're going to heal me. Uh, I can't. I mean, we're about to have a fight here. This is about to become a war. This is what the king, his name is Joram. This is what he's afraid of. Understandably so. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel, that there is a God in Israel that has given his power and his anointing to a prophet to make people see and know there is God. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel has long ago forsaken the worship of Yahweh. So that when someone comes demanding a healing, the king doesn't even call to mind that there is a prophet. But yet there is a little girl carried away somehow in God's sovereignty as a slave into captivity. She remembers God. She remembers the prophet and even has a heart that the foreign enemy might know this God. Now Joram, the king of Israel, cannot plead ignorance. It's not like he doesn't know Elisha. It's not like he doesn't know that there is one who has done mighty things in the name of Yahweh. It's just told a couple chapters earlier in 2 Kings of an experience when Joram was the king that Elisha miraculously provided water to, to quench the thirst and meet the need of three armies, including Joram's. But so have they neglected God that he doesn't even think to call the prophet. So God, somehow, the scriptures don't tell us how, he makes Elisha aware of the king's need, that the king has completely lost faith. I mean, contrasted to the, to the little child, the little girl who's a slave, who wants her master to know grace and deliverance and salvation, the king of Israel who ought to know better, freaks out and he tears his clothes in a panic. Elisha comes to his rescue. Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now Naaman, verse 9, came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And now Naaman is going to be confronted with his pride. Uh, Naaman has a great need. He knows he has a great need. He knows he needs to be rid of this leprosy. And he comes with every resource he has at his disposal. He comes with all the money, comes with the authority of a foreign king. And yet God will show Naaman that his problem exists within him. His problem is not that the outside of his body is diseased. His problem is that there is an arrogance and a pride lodged in his soul there is a throne in his soul that God must claim authority over. Only if Naaman will let him. I mean, this is a picture of salvation. There are none who come to salvation who do not acknowledge, I have a need and a problem that I can't meet. Can't buy it, can't coerce it, can't demand it. Must humble myself before the God who made me. So this is how Elisha confronts Naaman with his pride. Naaman shows up with his horses and his chariots and his enormous amount of gold and silver. I mean, could you imagine schlepping around 750 pounds of silver? That's a lot. I mean, you could put it in your trunk, except for they didn't have vehicles, right? You know this? They got to walk. It's about 150 miles from Damascus to Samaria. So it's about a two-week journey. Some have said, I don't know, that's just what I read. They get there. They come to the king's palace. King's like, can't help you. Elijah's like, send him here. They show up at Elisha's house with the chariots and the horses. 
This is a serious entourage. This is like as impressive as any royalty figure even today that expects a grand welcome that comes with all kind of pomp and fanfare. Shows up at Elisha's house. Elisha doesn't even come to the door. Elisha sends a messenger out. That's kind of offensive. I know you've come all this way with $4 million in tow, but I'm busy. I got stuff I'm doing in my house. He sends a messenger out. The messenger says, hey, nice to meet you. I assume the Bible doesn't say that. The messenger comes out and says, go to the Jordan River, dip yourself in seven times, and then you'll be clean. Now you're thinking, sweet deal. All I got to do is take a bath, like a super quick bath, seven times, and I'm healed of my great need? Sweet, I'll do it. Except for that's not what's happening. Elisha is confronting him with his pride, so he disrespects him. And then he tells him to go wash in the dirty river. Now, the Jordan River, you can Google it later. The Jordan River doesn't exactly look like something you want to swim in. And, interestingly enough, between Damascus and Samaria is the Jordan River. <laughs> You're not going to believe it. I know you've come about 150 miles, but you actually pass the place that you need to go. So just turn around, go about 30 miles back. When you come to the river, that's the river you need. Now, you're Naaman, and you're used to getting everything you want. You're used to walking in the room, and people stand up. You're used to wanting a drink, and you just say, drink, and somebody brings you a drink. I mean, you are used to being worshipped by other people. And so Elijah punches you in the nose, doesn't even come to the door, tells you to turn around, go back to a dirty river, and all you got to do is dip in there a few times, and you'll be good to go. Naaman is absolutely furious. Verse 11, he goes away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of Yahweh his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. He's been disrespected, humiliated, in front of his entourage, told to wash in a dirty river. And he says, the water we have at home is cleaner than this water. The two rivers that he references, they're fed by mountains. So they get runoff from the snow. That is some clean water. And he is confronted in his pride. And he responds about as well as you do when you are confronted with your pride. Now, for the second time in the story, a servant is far wiser than Naaman. Remember, it's the little girl who tells him about God in the first place. Now, his own servants call him to his senses. Verse 13, they come near and they say to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? That's all you have to do? You were going to give him $4 million. And he told you to just dip up and down in the water seven times. Isn't this an incredible word? Master, what, what would you not have done? If he told you to go bring him something, if he told you to go on a military conquest, wouldn't you have done it? I think, I think somehow the Holy Spirit has worked in Naaman. And I don't know, this seems pretty consistent with our experience. God does something in us. God confronts us with our pride as you have interacted with people who don't believe and you move towards them sharing the gospel and, and bringing to their minds their own sin and their own need for God, 
lots of people don't immediately consider the fact that you're saying they're a sinner that deserves to go to hell. Lots of people hear that and get offended because it confronts them in their pride. But somehow you leave room for the Spirit to do what only He can do. The Spirit uses Naaman's servants, calling him to his senses, and then he decides it's probably a good idea to do what the man of God says. So he goes down, dips himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh is restored. Like the flesh of a little child. A little child. I think the historian is drawing our attention to the little child that believed in God, that told Naaman about God. Jesus would say later in his ministry, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter into it. I think this is a picture of how powerful the truth is. The truth that this little girl shared, her simple, humble testimony offered to someone of great power and authority over her is what God uses for this one to come to salvation. Don't be intimidated about sharing the truth of the gospel with people around you. We're praying this month for people in our county that they would have a spiritual awakening. God very often uses people sharing the gospel with other people to come to a spiritual awakening. And it's easy to think, I don't know enough, I, but my own life isn't the way it ought to be. And Well, you can share the simple truth of God's goodness and the salvation that he offers to all in a similar way that this little child does. So Naaman is cleansed in the river and his skin is now like a little child. Salvation has come to this man. And now he responds with incredible gratitude. Instead of continuing on the way home, he's already a good portion of the way home, he turns around, he goes back to Samaria and he shows up again at Elisha's house. He returns to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he says, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. I think this is a picture of gratitude. I mean, when, when we see God's grace in our life and we realize we don't deserve it, we respond with gratitude. And so he comes back to Elisha, and he says, Please, take this. Now Elijah is about to get $4 million richer, except for he doesn't. He says, as Yahweh lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. Naaman urges him to take it, but Elisha refuses. It is by grace you are saved. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Lest Naaman somehow have any room to believe that somehow he has earned from God, warranted from God, or paid him back. Elisha says, no, I will not take any. Please, Elisha, please take it. Nope, I won't take it. Not only does Elisha not take from Naaman, Naaman is actually about to get more. I think this is a demonstration of God's overwhelming grace. You who are followers of Jesus, you have received the grace that Naaman received in salvation. But sometimes it's easy to imagine you got God's grace, now it's time for you to get to work. You got God's grace, you've prayed about this before, he's forgiven you about this before, like, come on, you're just tapped out. At some point, you're going to have to make a contribution. God is so gracious. Your obedience matters. Your faithfulness matters. But your faithfulness is not a limit on God's grace. He gives and He gives and He gives. You've not ruined it. You've not screwed it up forever. There is no one who is past receiving God's grace. Their entire life, a person can humble themselves before God as Naaman did and receive his grace. 
Don't ever give up praying for people, people in your family, people that you know, people that you despise. Will your heart by God's grace to pray that they would know his grace because nobody is too far gone and it's never too late because God gives grace and grace and grace and grace. So when Naaman says to Elisha, please accept my gift, but please just take something. Nope, won't do it. So then Naaman says, let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but Yahweh. So now he's going to take dirt back with him. I don't know if he's going to build his own altar. I'm not sure what he's going to do with it. But he receives even more. And now the story ends, I think, with a picture of Naaman's tenderness now towards God. Naaman is a changed man. He has been transformed. Yes, he got clean skin, but he got a clean soul. He knew he had a need. And don't many people in our culture know they have a need? Marriage is bad. Relationship with kid is bad. Health is bad. We are aware that we have needs, but most of our world lives in ignorance of their greatest need or in denial of their greatest need. Naaman has his needs met. And then now, I think as a demonstration of his tenderness towards God, he pleads for mercy. He says, in this matter, may Yahweh pardon your servant. And now he's going to describe a situation that he's asking God to be gracious to him in. When my master, now Naaman is speaking of his king, when my master goes into the house of Ramon, that's their false god, when he goes in there to worship, leaning on my arm, doesn't literally mean the king is hanging as an old decrepit man on the strong arm of his military commander. It's his way of saying, I am my king's right-hand man. So I go where the king goes. And when the king goes in to do what people do that don't believe in God and they go to worship their false god, like, this is my station in life. This is where God has placed me. When I go there with him into the temple of the false god and there where my master bows down, he asks for mercy. And I bow myself in the house of Ramon when my body, when I am forced to do this. May Yahweh pardon your servant in this matter. And Elisha says to him, go in peace. This story would have been so well known in Nazareth to the Jews of Jesus' day. When Jesus reminds them of God's incredible grace, they are offended by it. God desires to pour out his grace, not just on you as his child, again and again and again, as often as you come back to him in humility. Do you know God's desire is to give that same grace to the people who don't believe like you, the people who don't parent like you, the people who actually don't like you. And if they had the opportunity, they would do you harm. I mean, God just is this gracious. He's this great. Not only can you not plumb the depths of his graciousness, that same grace he desires to pour out on all people. Let's close this time together. Just, I want to give you a moment to just process this and reflect on this and give you some things to pray for and then the band will come and we'll close our time together in song. Let's pray. Will you first take a moment and thank God for the grace that he has poured out upon you?
Now would you take a moment, maybe this is the time where you'll pray for the 10 families that you have, or maybe this is the time to ask God to pour out His grace on the people that you don't like, the people that you count your enemies, or even the people that would count you theirs. And maybe the Lord will bring to your heart a reluctance to do that, or, or make you aware in your heart of um, the, uh, the affront to your pride that that is a little bit. You can confess that to God. And just even as you pray for grace upon others, uh, be mindful of what comes up in your own heart, and you can share that with the Lord too. Go ahead and take a moment and keep praying. And now will you take a moment and just thank God that his love and his grace is so vast and so rich and deep. Heavenly Father, we are humbled before you as one who is so supremely gracious. It is not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. God, would you know the joy of pouring out salvation upon all who would turn to you. God, give us courage and faith to be sharing the truth with those around us. And God, would you give us joy when we see people turn from themselves and their sin and find salvation in you. God, give us hearts that are increasingly like your heart. Give us, give us hearts like the young girl that though she was physically a slave, she desired the same salvation for those who had enslaved her. Oh God, what a heart. Help us likewise be conduits of your love and your grace to all that you would send us around. We pray together in Jesus' name, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.